Daniel chapter 6 is where we're going to be this morning. Um, And during 2020, um, I was trying to make sure I could still exercise, and all the things were shut down, all the gyms were shut down. So Peloton actually, surprisingly, gave away their app for for free during that time, for three months. And I got really excited about it. I don't have a Peloton bike. I have no intention of buying one. But I was like, okay, there's some workouts that you can do just at home if you just have a few dumbbells. And so I got a few dumbbells. I'm going to do these workouts. I can't wait uh, to just see how this goes for free. I get to sit, and somebody tells me what to do on my phone, and that sounds awesome to me. And so I, and no one can see me quit. There's no judgment. It's a phone telling me what to do. And so this one particular workout. I've done several in a row, done a couple weeks of it at this point. This one particular workout, this really skinny guy comes up. He probably weighs 130 pounds, but he's super ripped. Like every little muscle on his body is like clearly defined. He's like 0% body fat for for sure. So I was like, okay, he could help me. Um, And I started doing, he says, okay, today is all about tone. And all you need is a five pound dumbbell to do this. And I was like, psh, Five pounds for you, maybe. I need, you know, so I got a 10 pound dumbbell. I'm like, well, if he's doing five, I mean, I'm bigger than he is. I can do 10. And then I picked this thing up because I didn't want the shame of just walking into the garage and going like, what are you doing with five pounds? I wanted to look strong for my wife, right? And so I start this workout and he's like, all you got to do, and he'd do these little motions, like five pounds, holding your arms straight out. Uh, don't have any bend in your arm, just doing this. Okay, now we're going to do this little, these little small, little altercate, little small movements that he would do with five pounds. And again, I'm trying it with 10 pounds. And so the first minute I was fine, but that 90 seconds, I could feel like my arm begin to seize up. I could feel like my my hands starting to shake, and I'm like, then I went back down humbly to the recommended five-pound dumbbell weight, to which I also struggled uh, to get through it because it's only about 10 minutes of this, these little slight movements, little movements all through your arm and through your shoulders, and as I got done, I was like, wow, I am never doing this ever again. In fact, the next day, all of the little muscles in my arm, which, by the way, those are all the muscles in my arm, or little muscles in my arm, I, uh, were sore. Every little point that I felt was just incredibly sore and, and painful. And I learned something uh, that day, that getting stronger isn't always impressive. Like getting stronger isn't just going into the gym and finding the heaviest weight and see if you can max it out uh, right away. Because sometimes getting stronger looks like slow, unimpressive movements and building over time. And now this is the same for your spiritual life. Sometimes for some of us, we want to say, well, I need to grow in Christ. So I've got to do this heavy lifting. Like I've got to understand like what Leviticus is all about and all the meanings of Leviticus and understand and memorize all the Levitical uh, law. Or some of you say, well, I want to understand. I want to master the Trinity. I want to master five points of Calvinism, or I want to master what uh, the end times really means. And so we kind of go after um, the heavy thing, but can I tell you that maybe it's important for us just to um, slow down. Maybe it's important for us to do something that's just simple, but leads to growth, like a simple rhythm and discipline of prayer. A simple approach to just regularly reading the Bible. A simple, I want to be in a discipleship uh, relationship with someone else. So for you, maybe before you're thinking, I need to be a missionary in the 1040 window in the unreached pe- places in the world, maybe it's just, maybe I should share the gospel with the people around me first, right? So it's not just heavy lifting. Maybe it's these small things that then when we are faced with something heavier, then we are ready. And I tell you this because this is what's happening in Daniel chapter 6, famously called Daniel and the Lion's Den. And if you grew up in the church, or maybe you didn't, you're probably really familiar um, with this story of this man named Daniel that had enough faith that was able to encounter a lion's den without being harmed. And Here's the thing that I got out of it growing up. I would often hear this story separate or isolated from 
Daniel's whole life. And so I understood it as, okay, all I got to do is just be a really faithful, good person. Like, I got to have good character. I got to make sure all the teachers like me, and I make all the good grades. And if I do that, all things are going to happen good for me. Like, nothing bad is going to come my way. Like, if I'm a good student, and I really love people, and I do the right things, and have good integrity, then if I accidentally slip into the lion's pit while visiting the zoo, nothing is going to happen to me. That's kind of how I understood this story. But I don't want you to miss this fits, this story fits in a grand narrative of Daniel's whole life. And the reason why Daniel was able to go through perhaps this giant, maybe one of the biggest challenges of his life facing the lion's den is because he was faithful, listen, in more simple, and I would even say in unimpressive ways. It's not that Daniel was slack in his faith and then all of a sudden he was thrown in the lion's den and knew exactly what to do. No, Daniel was able to be faithful in this hard season because he was, chose to be faithful in the less difficult seasons, the less impressive seasons. And that's the big idea that we're going to unpack this morning in Daniel chapter 6. How can we really grow our faith in such a way that helps us face the challenges ahead. Now, I've said this to you a whole bunch as a, as a church. There's three things I believe that God uses in our life to grow us in Christ. First is God's word and the gospel. We need to know that. We need to be in God's word to grow. Secondly, our people. We need the people of God. Relational needs seminar, plug, four o'clock this afternoon. Um, and third is suffering. So for us to grow in Christ, we often have to go through a season of suffering. God, uh, not that he causes it in your life, but God is definitely sovereign over your suffering. He can use it for his glory and use it to grow. So how do you then handle a season of suffering? How do you then handle a season where it's really difficult to trust God? And here's how. Following God in the simple ways right now, even when you're not suffering. Like daily uh, trying to obey and walk in holiness to God. And this was the story of Daniel. So Daniel chapter 6, we've seen Daniel do it so far. We saw it in Daniel chapter 1. He's, Daniel and his friends were teenagers. They were captured by King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is a Babylonian ruler. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is telling Daniel what to do. Daniel chooses to obey God rather than Nebuchadnezzar. You see in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel um, interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream and he gives him the truth of God's word and he's not afraid to stand up to the king. You see in Daniel chapter 3, Daniel's friends, they follow Daniel's example and they refuse to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar even though that meant that they might die. Daniel chapter 4, you see Daniel boldly warn Nebuchadnezzar that if he doesn't repent, God will remove the kingdom from him, which is exactly what happened. Nebuchadnezzar is humbled by God. God later restores the kingdom back to Nebuchadnezzar. Then it all goes all the way up to Daniel chapter 5. Time has passed. Daniel now, is Nebuchadnezzar's out of the picture, Neb, uh, Daniel's still under Babylonian rule. He's probably now about 80 years old or so. And Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, we unpacked this last week in Daniel 5, Belshazzar, he now leads Babylon. He's likely worse than Nebuchadnezzar because he's equally as narcissistic and he does not fear God. And Daniel firmly warns him, unless he repents, God is going to remove the kingdom from him and he will be destroyed. Daniel refute, um, you see Belshazzar try to worship Daniel. Daniel refuses his worship. You see Belshazzar try to give Daniel gifts of a gold chain around his neck and a royal robe. Daniel refuses all of those things. Daniel has been faithful to God in simple ways all throughout this story. And what happens at the end of five, Daniel five, God humbles Belshazzar and he raises up an army of, of the Medes and the Persians and they come in and overnight wipe out the Babylonians. And now the empire is a Medo-Persian empire. And Daniel is now um, the th ranked third in power in the kingdom. So now he's the third most influential person in the world at that time. Daniel's character and his faith has been put through the test all of these years. And now we're going to see Daniel face one of his most difficult Tests being thrown in a lion's den. And look what happens up to this point. Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 1. 
And it pleased Darius. Darius is now the ruler of the Medo-Persian Empire. He's the new king, right? To set over the kingdom 120 satraps. Satraps are like governors to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them, three presidents of whom Daniel was one to whom these satraps should give account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became disgusted above all other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king planned to set him over, listen to this, the whole kingdom. So think about all, every, all the things where Daniel's come from. Daniel's now in his 80s, possibly even his early 90s. Daniel was a teenage boy captured by the Babylonians. Babylonians are overthrown. Now Daniel is the third most powerful and influential person in the Medo-Persian Empire. God would raise up a godly man to be in a godless culture so that God would be able to show off his power and his glory. It's awesome. And now you're seeing this thing that it it seems like, okay, why is it that Daniel, if he's such a strong believer, if he loves the Lord this much, why is he choosing uh, to work in this secular environment, this environment that's seemingly uh, godless and hopeless? And here's why. God would use Daniel's vocation to show his power. This is a really an important thing because uh, when we think about our jobs, we often think of uh, if it's secular or it's, or it's, or it's Christian. It's, it's got to be, for me to be, um, for me to be known, I've got to be in this Christian job. I have to have this Christian influence. Maybe for me to be um, used by the kingdom, I've got to be in full-time ministry, a vocational ministry. I've got to be a pastor or a missionary. Can I just tell you that God wants to use you in your role like right now. Like whatever you're doing right now, this is one of the things that God has done for the glory of God. And sometimes I think we get in this narrative, this this false narrative that God can't use me. But can I just tell you, God can use you right now in your work. In fact, your job is actually your calling. There's a theological viewpoint called the doctrine of vocation or the doctrine of work. And it's just seeing our everyday job as a calling. And if you're struggling with that right now, I encourage you, Right now, uh, go buy the book, God at Work by Gene Veith, Gene Veith, V-E-I-T-H. God at Work by Gene Veith is one of my favorite books because it shows how God uses vocation, people's work, everyday life, so that he would glorify himself and that he would redeem this world for the gospel. Uh, You even see Gene Veith, I'll, I'll read one of the quotes from the book. He says, the priesthood of all believers did not make everyone into church workers. Rather, it turned every kind of work, listen to this, into a sacred calling. Every kind of work into a sacred calling. Gene Veith got a lot of his ideas, by the way, from uh, the great reformer Martin Luther. Martin Luther, in his volume work of, of Psalm 147, he talks about the, uh, the, the gospel at work. He says, Good God could easily give you a grain and fruit without your plowing and planting, but he does not want to do so. What else is all our work to God, whether in the fields, in the garden, in the city, uh, in the house, in war, or in government, but just as a child's performance by which he wants to give you his gifts in the fields, at home, and everywhere else, whatever your job is. He says, I want you to do that. And then he says, listen to this. I love this statement. These are the masks of God behind which he wants to remain concealed to do all things. What does he say about your work, whatever it is that you do? If you are a doctor or a teacher or a garbage man or you're a homeschool parent, listen to this. He says those are masks of God in this community, that God would show himself off even through your work. And can I just tell you, If believers who love Jesus, who are filled with the Holy Spirit and want to make much of Christ, you have such an impact and a calling where you are right now. I I want to say even more than a a pastor would be. Because you're around non-believers more than I am. I'm around church folks most of the time. For me to get out, i got to get out of my neighborhood. i got to meet neighbors. Another way that I get to meet people and share the gospel with them is fishing. When I fish, I get to share and meet people and talk to them about Jesus. But i got to make myself do it. Like You are automatically in the community 
every single day. And I'll just work once a week. Everybody knows that, right? That's all that pastors do. We always work once a week, right? That's a joke. All right. So Daniel has done this faithfully. And now he's got the third most influential position. And Daenerys has a plan to make Daniel the, uh, kind of the ruler of all the Medo-Persian empire. So you would think he's well-liked because of this. And the opposite is so. Look at verse 4. Then the presidents and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful in no error or fault was found in him. Now, this doesn't mean that he's sinless, but they saw him as above reproach. They wanted to find a fault so they can prove to Darius, this is not your guy. Trust me, you don't want him. So they're trying to find something wrong out of jealousy, out of anger, out of, um, out of all these things. They wanted Daniel to be removed from his role. So I want to unpack a little bit about what it means to be above reproach. Now, we see no fault in him in the Old Testament. Uh, the New Testament language is above reproach. We hear about it a lot. If you grew up in church, maybe you heard the phrase, like, we got to make sure we're above reproach. We even see in 1 Timothy 3, uh, Titus chapter 1, when there's a qualification for pastors or leaders, is that they are above reproach. You see uh, Paul talk about it in 2 Corinthians for people who uh, communicate the word of God. They should be above reproach. Reproach, And sometimes people think that means like people should never find any fault in you. And that's not necessarily the case. Of course people are going to find fault in you if you are not Jesus, right? And so it, I, I, I grew up uh, with some legalistic background. And so above reproach meant make sure that you live a life that no one could ever think that you're doing something wrong. So it's like don't ever go to a movie. Because if you're at a movie, somebody's going to think you're going to watch the really bad movie, and then they're going to judge you based on you making that decision. Or don't ever eat at a restaurant with a bar, because they might assume that you're already drunk because there you are at a restaurant with a bar. Anybody tracking with me? Anybody knew that kind of background? I had that background. So it was a lot of fear about, don't ever do anything that somebody might think um, that you are doing the wrong thing. Now, of course, we want to use wisdom, but we can't live in constant fear by what others think. Because being above reproach, it means something should not stick to you. Meaning, you are going to fail at times, more than once, most likely in the very same way. But above reproach means, is there a pattern of sin? Is there unrepentance there? Does this person have the reputation of being deceptive or cruel? Does this person have the reputation of being a gossip? or a drunk, or divisive? Does it stick to them? What's their reputation? Above reproach means if there's an accusation about this person, it should, not be, it should be met with, that doesn't really seem like a part of their character to act this way. Yeah, yeah I, I know that they make mistakes, just like all of us. They sin, just like all of us, because they're human. But their reputation is a person who I know is fighting sin, or growing toward holiness. That's what above reproach means. And so Daniel is found faultless, not to mean that he's sinless, but people know of his reputation as not one who is constantly falling into wickedness or being unjust. Second of all, just because you have a good reputation, that doesn't mean that you'll automatically be liked, or that doesn't mean that you won't face accusation. Daniel was faithful to God through all these years, yet there's still a good number of people that did not like him. And so what do they do? Because they can't judge him based on their moral code, they figure out another way. Look in verse five. Then the men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it, listen to this, in connection with the law of his God. Isn't that interesting? Then the presidents and the satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O oh, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, uh, the prefects 
and the satraps and counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction. And, who, and listen to this, that whoever makes a petition to any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So you see what these jealous leaders do. They say, we can't, uh, there's nothing based on our law or our moral code that we can judge Daniel, but we, here's what we're going to do. And this is kind of brilliant what they come up with. Let's judge Daniel on his own moral code, on his own um, law, what his God says is right or wrong. Let's judge him on that. And so it, it sounds like this, and here's, it, it's going to come two ways. They're going to judge him on what his Bible or his law would say, not only that, but they're also going to use King Darius's ego to try to trap Daniel. And so it sounds like this. Hey, hey, Darius, I know that you're really smart. We know that you know everything. And all the people then should know that you know everything. So that means all the people should depend on you for everything. And so here's what I think you should do. This is what, these, um, th- this is what his uh, counsel was saying. We think that instead of for 30 days, instead of for people praying to their own God, for 30 days, they should pray to you. Because by doing so, they're going to know that you're wise, they're going to know that you are sufficient, and then they will know that you are sovereign. And so Darius, for some crazy reason, agrees to this. I don't know if he's ever been trained in boundaries or read the book Boundaries, but I would highly recommend it for Darius, because here's why. Why would anyone want that responsibility? Like, okay, instead of people praying to God, they're going to pray to me, and I've got to show that I can solve all and answer all of their prayers. Like, who wants to sign up for that? I don't. Like, I, I think I'm a pretty nice guy, but I don't want to hear all your prayers. I'm be honest with you, because I cannot solve all your prayers. There's only one who can, and that's, his name is Jesus. And so we pray to him because we know that's one of the beautiful aspects of God and his character. We can come to God and we can ask any time of the day, any time of night. We can come to him and we can ask and he will meet all of our needs and comfort us in all of our affliction. And Darius is like, yep, I think I can do that. Bro, this is going to be a rough 30 days for you, all right? And so he signs up. He says, yes, I'm going to do it for 30 days. And look what happens, verse 8. It says, now, O king, they're they're still talking to him. His counsel is talking to him. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. So here's what's happening. In the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, there was a custom that once a law was passed, it cannot be changed. And the reason being is because kings would often change things based on their own temperament. Like if they didn't like something, if they were frustrated at something, they would make a law immediately so that it would appease their emotions or their frustrations. In other words, yes, NC State is better than Carolina and Duke this year. So a king would say, I don't think anyone should wear an NC State apparel for 30 days, right? They could say that kind of thing. And kings would often respond violently against things in the moment. And so they said, once something is signed, you can't change it. So it was for two reasons. One, if, some, if, if um, it, would change, it would make the king more reasonable. But secondly, if, if a king were to change his own law, it would prove that he, would, he had made a mistake. And so they're trying to show that the king is all-knowing by saying once he signs something, it should not be changed. And so Darius, he signs this. And now look at what Daniel does. Verse 10 is probably my favorite in all the book of Daniel. Verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, what does he do? He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber to open toward Jerusalem. And he got down on his knees three times a day. And he prayed and he gave thanks before his God. Listen to this. As he had done previously. I love this. Daniel hears this petition. You cannot pray to your God for 30 days. You can only pray to King Darius because he's sovereign. And what does Daniel, old Daniel do? He's probably this man in his older upper 80s or early 90s. He goes to his home. He opens his windows and his doors. He's not hiding. And he prays to his God three times a day, just like he had done previously. He's not hiding at all. People can see him. 
you imagine this important legal document, you imagine the Oval Office and you have the president signing a document and the press is all there, they're ready to witness all the people and their reaction and then you have someone that's on the White House staff blatantly disobeying the law that the king gave, this signature that the king would make so that the very cameras can see it. That's Daniel's boldness and that's his obedience to his God. And don't forget, this is a trap for Daniel. So you better believe that when Darius is signing this, everyone's looking at Daniel. And Daniel just goes to his house, the window's open, the door's open for all to see, and he prays down, and he bows and prays to his God like he's been doing, listen, for years. He's not angry, he doesn't blow up at the king, but he's just remaining faithful as he always had. In addition, there's something that happens here that is simple and subtle, but what does his prayer contain? A thankfulness to God. He prays and gives thanks to God. Now, I don't know about you, but you're told that you are going to be thrown in a den of lions. Is that your reaction? Thankfulness to God? I ain't thinking God, right? I'm like, God, get me out of this. Help me uh, destroy my enemies. I would give all those kind of David-like prayers, but he stops and gives thanks. I don't know what you thank God for. Lord, thank you that I'm going to be a source of protein for the lions today. Like, what do you thank God for in this moment? But I think this is a good posture because we don't see uh, Daniel's anxiety, but we do know that he's a human being. And I would feel anxious knowing that I'm going to get thrown in the den of lions. So why give thanks in the face of anxiety? Here, here's a, a, a verse, a, a, a chapter I want to show you. It's, it's from um, Psalm 57. David has his enemies. They're closing in on him. David is hiding in a cave. David is anxious. And what does David do in the midst of anxiety? Listen, he thanks God. He praises God. And I want you to see this chapter because it's going to remind you of Daniel. Look at what it says. Psalm 57, verse 1. David says, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. This is an anxious man whose life is threatened. In the shadow of your wings I shall take refuge. Till the storm of destruction shall pass by. I cry out to most to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will sin from heaven and save me. He will put the shame, uh, him, him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. I want you to see all the praise and the worship of God, even in the midst of anxiety. Look at verse four. My soul is in the midst of lions. Isn't that interesting? This is David, not Daniel saying this. David's saying this. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid Fear, uh, fiery beast, the, the child of man whose teeth and spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make a melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O oh, harp and lyre, I will wake the dawn. I will give thanks to you. This is an anxious man saying, I give thanks to you, O oh, Lord, among the prophets. I will sing praises to you among the nations. Your steadfast love is great to the heavens. Your steadfast, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O oh, God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. This is Paul. uh, This is David, rather. He is both anxious and he's giving praise. And that's why it's so important because what helps us when we feel anxious is stopping and reminding ourselves who can actually comfort us in our anxiety. Who can actually strengthen us in our weaknesses. And this is Daniel here in Daniel chapter 6. 
He's not going to be removed from human feelings or emotions. Rather, he stops and he praises God and he says, God, you're the source of comfort. I'm going to praise you and give thanks to you right now. And so for, for those of you who maybe you feel afraid or maybe you feel anxious, maybe a place is just stopping and praising God for who he is. Because by doing so, you're reminding of yourselves of the one who can calm your soul and restore your heart. And so Daniel, he prays to God in this prayer. But even though he prays, it doesn't make the inevitable reality go away. Look in verse 11. Then the man came by agreement and found Daniel making a petition and plea before his God. They saw him praying. And they came near and said to the king, They said, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or any man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered, the thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. And the king answered and said before the king Daniel, who is one of the exiles of Judah, pays no attention to you, O king or the injunction that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed. He, he loved Daniel, right? He was distressed, and he set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be charged. And then the king commanded and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, and this is interesting, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. Now, you have King Darius. He clearly cares for Daniel in some capacity, but he knows that he cannot break his own law And so he's forced to throw Daniel into the lion's den. And just to point out, just a side note, the worst thing that they thought could happen to Daniel was be thrown in a room full of cats, which is a reminder that all cats are evil and dogs are better. Amen. (laughs) But for real, though, I don't know if you've ever seen a lion up close, but it is terrifying. I've actually been to Kruger National uh, Forest in South Africa. I saw a, a lion way off in the distance, and I was completely fine with that. Uh, it's, one of, it's very horrifying and scary. I, there was blood surrounding him. He just had a fresh meal, and I was just shaking, going, please don't see us and notice us in this little Toyota truck. Don't, don't, please don't eat us alive, Right. And I don't know, this is another little side note, but a hippopotamus actually kills more people in Africa than any other animal, which is fascinating. So if you see a hippopotamus, you'd be more afraid than you would if you're a lion. These are all scenario hypothetical things in case you're in Africa. But (laughs) Daniel is falsely accused and he's thrown into a den of lions. And then what happens is something really interesting and there's something that's almost figurative that happens here. And the stone, listen to this. A stone was brought and laid in the mouth of the lion's den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Now, does that remind y'all of anything? A stone that's rolled away, a stone that's rolled in place that no one can get out. Uh, it's happening in about six weeks, this thing. I won't tell you what it is, but it reminds with Keister. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's Easter, okay? All right. There's no other word that, remind, that is, rhymes with Easter. Good luck finding it. Verse 18, all right. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. This is Darius. He's anxious. He spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him. And sleep fled from him. Then at the break of day, the king arose and they went into haste in the den of lions. So you can feel the angst of the king. He could not sleep all night. Hopefully you were paying attention. You weren't trying to figure out another word that rhymed with Easter. Verse 20, as he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, oh, Daniel's servant, Of the living God has your God whom you continually have been able, who you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the den of lions. And then in verse 21, Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Now, this is trash talk. I don't know if you know this or not. 
Because if you notice what took place earlier, when his servants or when his advisors speak to him, him, they will say to Darius, O king, live forever. And Daniel's saying something really similar. It's sort of a snarky jab to a king from an old man who just loves the Lord. And then you see this happen in verse 22. He says, my God sent his angel and shut, um, shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before the king and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. In verse 23, or 23, he says, the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, den and no harm was found on him because he trusted in his God. Now, I love this because when I think about everyone that was, what was all the things that were taking place at night, Daniel was thrown into the den and Daniel was the only one who had a good night's sleep. You have Darius who's anxious. You have Darius's friends who are partying because they think Daniel is dead. You have Daniel's friends likely up all night anxious and praying. Daniel is the only one who got a good night's sleep because he trusted God and an angel came and shut the lion's mouth. And then what does Darius do? He looks to Daniel's God. He begins to trust in the power of Daniel's God. But what happens? 24. And this is the part that does not show up in Veggie Tales. And the king commanded... And those men who had miraculously accused Daniel were brought in to the den of lions. They, their children, their wives. And before they reached to the bottom of the den, the, Daniel, the, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Now, I think this is an important part of the story. First of all, I just want to say this is descriptive, not prescriptive. It's not saying that God is in favor of the killing of innocent women and children. In fact, the book of uh, Ezekiel, God commands that children should never be punished by the sins of their parents because the ancient world, though, was violent and cruel. And the, the point that I think this makes is it shows that the lions were, in fact, hungry, that before they even hit the den, the, the floor of the den, these innocent women and children were taken by the lions. And the reason why Daniel is there is to make a light in a dark, pagan, violent, godless world. And that is why Daniel exists, because this is what you see in verse 25. The, then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth. He says, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is, listen to this, the living God who endures forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. And he has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Now, I love this part because it, this chapter begins with a boycott on prayer, but it ends with a praise and honestly, like a little mini sermonette from a pagan king. Can you see that? Look again at the, at the passage in verse 25. This is a really good little sermon that he preaches. Verse 25, he, um, you have... Um, the King Darius, he says, all people and nations and languages should worship God. He recognizes Daniel's God is for all people, nations, and languages. Uh, verse 26, he realizes that God, Daniel's God, is all powerful and that he's sovereign. He calls him the living God. He says that he endures forever. He says this kingdom will never be destroyed. Verse 27, he sees that Daniel's God is a faithful God, that he delivers and that he rescues, that he's a near God. He's not far away. What does he do? He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. And then in verse 27, he even sees that he is a savior. He has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. This is a pagan God whose, whose goal is only to make much of himself, and now he's making much of the God of the Bible. And this is a solid encouragement because some of the best messages, some of the best, most powerful words in the book of Daniel came from pagan kings. 
Uh, You see it in Nebuchadnezzar, in Nebuchadnezzar chapter 4, when he's humbled by God, he recognizes God's might and God's power. Nebuchadnezzar is the most powerful ruler of that time in the world, and he stops and he worships God. You see uh, the same thing happen with Darius. Darius is a powerful, wicked, violent ruler. God humbles him, and he praises Daniel's God because he realizes that God is better. And all of this, listen, all of this is happening because of simple men and women like you and I who are in a godless culture that decide just to remain faithful. And all of this, if we want to see God's power work, we don't have to be some spectacular uh, communicator. Or some, I always hear like people say, well, I really hope this professional athlete becomes a Christian. Then everyone will believe. Listen, it's simple believers who make much of God in a godless culture. It's everyday believers who make God um, known in a godless culture where God can, that the people around us can see God's power. It's a simple, simple obedience. And when we read this, we see Daniel, and he's there, and he's facing the lion's den. It almost seems like he does so with ease, like he's not panicked at all, like most of us would be. But there's some simple things that Daniel did that caused him to be ready for that huge moment of faith where he would face the lion's den. Some simple things we see right here in the passage. One is prayer. We we don't know much about Daniel's daily disciplines, but we, this passage gives us a little insight, a little peek behind the curtain of how he prays. It says that he has a habit of prayer where he does so three times a day. And the passage says that he's been, like he's, he has done previously. We can assume that he's been doing this for years of his life, facing Jerusalem and praying three times a day to his God. And again, this is all descriptive, not prescriptive. It's not saying you have to pray three times a day to have a deep connection to God. But what we do see in the New Testament, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, that we pray without ceasing. It should be a part of our life, that we are faithful to God just by praying, just by turning to him. When we wake up in the morning, we say, God, I'm not depending on myself. I'm depending on you. God, help me fight this sin. God, help me work through this relational conflict. God, help me to be faithful to you at work. Help me to make much of you. Just those simple ways of showing that we are dependent on the Lord. And prayer was a small thing that Daniel practiced, but he did it so often. In addition, Daniel said yes to God in simple ways first. If you think back in Daniel chapter 1, you had the food that the king Nebuchadnezzar was trying to give him. Daniel says, no, I have my own king that I worship. Thank you very much. I would like to eat the food that he tells me to eat. Uh, you think even at the last chapter, you have uh, King Belshazzar that's trying to praise Daniel for his work, praise Daniel for interpreting the writing of the wall. And what does he do? He tries to give Daniel a gold necklace around his neck and a royal robe, and Daniel refuses. Simple ways of obedience, what we see over and over again, the little small movements in the arms, it doesn't seem like I'm getting stronger, but yes, you are. And this is what happens over and over again in Daniel's life. It reminds me of what Paul says to the Philippians and to the, to the Philippian church in Philippians 1 verse 9. He says, my prayer that your love may abound more and more with all knowledge and discernment. So simple obedience, loving others, growing in knowledge, growing in discernment, so that why? So that you may approve what is excellent So to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What is he saying? It's just growing in love, growing in knowledge, growing in discernment so that one day when you are challenged with something difficult, you will, he says, approve what is excellent. So that one day when you finally meet the Lord face to face, you say, you know what? I was just faithful to you and even in the small ways. So one day I would prove what is excellent. There's another story of a guy named Daniel that took place in 1984 in the movie Karate Kid. Um, It's the story of a high school student named Daniel LaRusso who moved into a new town. And what do we know about the story? Where he was bullied by a group of teenagers who also knew or happened to know karate. And to fight off these bullies, he requested karate lessons from his Asian landlord named Mr. Miyagi. And he shows up at Mr. Miyagi's house after Mr. Miyagi agrees to um, help him grow in his karate skills or to train him. And what happens? Daniel shows up. And Daniel's thinking, okay, he's going to show me how to punch and how to block and how to kick and do cool stuff. But what does Mr. Miyagi do? Everybody who's 35 and above will help me with this. 
but the first, wax on, wax off, right? Um, paint the fence, sand the floor. So paint the fence is up, down, up, down. Um, a few days later, or next day, it's um, wax the car, wax on, wax off, um, sand the floor, left, right, left, right. And so he paints the entire fence, he sands the floor of his deck, he waxes on and off all the cars, and he does all this kind of stuff. And Daniel's finally, after days and days and days of doing this, as he thinks, free labor uh, for Mr. Miyagi, he goes up and says, are you going to teach me anything? You're just using me to, to fix all your, do all your chores. And then he, Mr. Miyagi stands there and tells him to punch at him. And then he has this motion of wax on, wax off and up and down. And, and he's standing the floor underneath, like he's be able to defend himself. And I got to tell you this, if you try to learn karate that way, you will get killed. All right. This is a movie is not true about how you learn karate. All right. But what it does show is that Daniel cannot face these bullies until he learns simple things. And that's what you get away from. Simple disciplines of just learning and trying and striving and saying, no, I'm not going to stand up to my biggest challenge. I've got to learn simple things first. And so for some of you, if you're wondering um, whether or not you're going to have enough faith to get through the challenges of life, and part of, part of that is going to be for you to be faithful in small things right now. Like if you're asking, well, how in the world if one day if, if my parents die or if I have a loss of a friend or a loved one, how am I going to have enough faith to endure that? Friends, the answer to that question is how are you being faithful right now when you're not tried and when it's not difficult? If you're saying, how am I going to be faithful to my spouse if I'm ever tempted to step outside of my marriage? Friend, be faithful right now with how you bring your wandering eyes before the Lord and hold your thoughts captive before God. If you're wondering, man, how can I be faithful if my faith is ever persecuted, if I'm like, if, if our country becomes one of these places that kills people for the gospel, if it ever happens that way, am I gonna remain faithful? Friends, the only way you'll know that is be faithful right now. Preach the gospel to friends and loved ones and family members. Be faithful right now. Don't wait for the big area of, of temptation to find out whether or not you're faithful. Start being faithful right now. Uh, start praying right now. Uh, pay attention to your own heart right now. Like when you're minimizing, maybe like what you would say is smaller sins, like maybe little white lies, maybe a little bit of gossip here, and we just say bless their heart at the end so it doesn't become gossip, right? We do these little things. Pay attention to that right now. Obey God when no one sees it right now. Uh, practice obedience, even if it's a small step of obedience, because what you're doing is you're growing and maturing your faith. Daniel was ready for the lion's den because he obeyed the Lord in the small things. And here's something I want to tell you, is, even as we unpack this. And we, here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to go, okay, Daniel's a faithful picture of who God is, so I'm going to pray for three times a day, and then I will be ready to face the big challenge. Now, Daniel is not the hero of the story. It's not that you'll be like Daniel and God will be happy with you. There's only one hero of the story and his name is Jesus. Because the sober part of the story is the picture where the innocent die. The, the women and the children die because of the sins of the father or the husband. That's the sobering part of the story. That picture that we see shows the horrifying nature of the reality of the lions. Jesus Christ was like Daniel in the sense that Jesus Christ was many sought to find fault in Jesus and fault in none. And they put him in the lion's den. They threw him in the reality of the cross. And Jesus was torn apart. Jesus was not rescued like Daniel. And I love what Sa um, Sally Lloyd-Jones says in her reflection of Daniel 6 in the lion's den. She says, Jesus was left in the blackness, utterly alone and abandoned by God, suffering the fate that we, the guilty ones, deserved. Do you hear that? God did not shut the mouth of Jesus' lions like he did Daniel's. He let them tear him apart his body was left entombed in the icy grip of death for three days, 
before the angel finally came to roll away his stone. Daniel was found faultless, but he was not sinless. Jesus was faultless and sinless. Jesus, who was without sin, he was accused and he was tried and he was sent to death on the cross. No angel was there to stop it and his body was torn apart and broken for you and I. And three days later, an angel rolled away the stone and he rose from the grave. And he did that so that you and I would be seen as faultless. He did that for you and I's sin. He was torn apart for our sin. And here's why obedience is possible. Because Christ was obedient for you. That Christ became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So if this morning you're wondering, well, how do I grow in my righteousness? How do I grow in my faith? Listen, you can be faithful in the small things because Christ was faithful before you. And faith in God means that you put your trust in Christ, which means if you're not a believer and you're like, man, I would love to have that kind of faith. I would love to have that kind of courage. Listen, the point is not being faithful like Daniel. The point is putting your faith in Jesus by repenting of your sins and believing in Christ and his work on the cross. And for those of us who believe, we never move away from that truth. Because we say, if I want to grow in righteousness, the the promise of the gospel is this, that what he started in you when he saved you is what he's going to finish, which means you're going to grow. Your faith is going to mature because you have the spirit living inside of you. And so the response is, it's not, how can I be like Daniel? It's, how, how do I get to live like Jesus because the spirit lives in me. It's just believing in the gospel for you. And so church, I don't want you to leave here thinking I gotta do better. It's I gotta just, I gotta rest in the gospel. So this morning, if you wanna be faithful, you can be faithful in the small things. You can be faithful in the big things because Christ was faithful before us. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your work. We're grateful for this story. And God, we're grateful for what this story points us to, a truer and better king and a truer and better Daniel. And God, as the promises that you brought Daniel out of the the pit, Lord, you brought your son out of death for us. And so God, as we think about what it means to be faithful, Lord, help us not to look at Daniel, but help us to look at Jesus that Jesus went ahead of us, that Jesus died for us and he rose for us so that we, when we are judged based on what we do, we're judged only by what Christ has done for us. So when the Father looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness for us. And so God, help us to rest in that truth. Help us to know that your spirit is with us. And so God, help us as your spirit is with us to be faithful in small ways. Maybe it's even just prayer, it's being in your word, Maybe it's just obeying God and fighting sin in small ways that we see in our life that we often want to ignore. And God, I pray that you would do that, Lord, so that one day we will approve what is excellent. When we're faced with a hard challenge or a difficult trial, Lord, we know that you are with us because you've been with us throughout this whole time because of what you've done for us. So God, may we trust you today. In Jesus' name, amen.